Out for Blood. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. Like a lot of cities in the 1970s, Sacramento, the capital of California, was also very dangerous. But a huge contributor to the city's fear wasn't a crime lord or a ring of organized criminals. It was a man, a serial killer, whose trademark was drinking the blood of his victims after he killed them. His name was Richard Chase, and drinking blood is one of the less horrific actions of the man the media would call the Vampire of Sacramento. We're going to be talking about some very gruesome shit on this episode involving cannibalism, rape, suicide, child murders, animal and human mutilation, and more than that. So if this doesn't seem like a good fit for you right now, this episode, please skip to a different, less violent episode. For those of you who stay, it's going to get graphic. Richard Chase grew up in Sacramento and showed signs of mental illness at a very young age. And unfortunately, being raised in an abusive household only compounded his pathology. Richard's father, a strict and sometimes physically violent parent, escalated Chase's illness so much that by the age of five, he was showing the three signs of the McDonald triad. Do you know what that is? I do not know what that is. It is the metric of serial killers. So the three factors are bedwetting. Uh, um, animal, is there animal? Animal mutilation. Yes, yeah. yeah, setting fires. Those are the three kind of benchmarks. In 1963, some criminologists and psychologists predicted Serial killers is what they said. And Ted Bundy is, is one of the main people that they studied. So this guy, Chase, exhibited all three of these things. And again, it's debated whether this is actually true. But if we're talking about a serial killer at a certain point in their life, you know, age five, very, very young, that are doing these things, bedwetting, animal mutilation, and setting small fires, this would be a case in point. So as Chase grew up, his mental illness worsened. As an adolescent, he used drugs to self-medicate because he had horrible hypochondria. He often complained that his heart would occasionally stop beating or that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery. Chase would hold oranges on his head, believing that in doing that, vitamin C would be absorbed by his brain and make him healthier. He also thought his blood was turning into powder. Finally, and most vehemently, Chase believed his cranial bones had been separated and were floating around like tectonic plates under the earth. So he shaved all of his hair off to be able to monitor the movement of his skull bones. Believing his mother was going to poison him, he left home and rented an apartment with friends. Not surprisingly, I'm sure, Chase's roommates soon regretted their decision, as Chase was near constantly under the influence of alcohol, marijuana, and LSD. Chase would also walk around the apartment completely naked, even in front of people who didn't live there. Also, unsurprisingly, Chase's roommates demanded that he move out. But when Chase refused, they cut their losses and moved out instead. So we have this mentally ill 21-year-old alone in his own apartment. What does he do? Well... Chase began to capture, kill, and disembowel various animals, which he would then devour raw, sometimes mixing the organs with Coca-Cola in a blender and drinking it, believing that these raw Coca-Cola and animal entrail smoothies somehow prevented his heart from shrinking. Unsurprisingly, Chase spent a brief time in the psychiatric ward in 1973, and in 1975, at the age of 25, he attempted to inject rabbit's blood into his veins. After becoming violently ill, he went back to the institution to prevent him from becoming a danger to others or himself. There he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was said to have been shocking to the patients and staff. Shocking even for a psychiatric hospital. Chase's fascination with blood earned him the nickname Dracula. Assistants would witness Chase killing birds in an attempt to drink their blood to stave off the effects of poison that Chase thought was slowly turning his own blood again into powder. In spite of this, in 1976, the staff believed that they had finally rehabilitated Chase, and he was released. He lived with his mother, where she slowly weaned him off of his medication and got him his own apartment. He initially shared this apartment with roommates, but then, of course, all of them moved out, leaving the 26-year-old Chase alone again, his mental illness unchecked and escalating. In 1977, Chase was arrested on a reservation in Pyramid Lake, Nevada. His body was smeared with blood, and a bucket of blood was found in his truck. The blood was determined to be cow's blood, and no charges were filed. 
but things were only getting worse. On December 29, 1977, Richard Chase's mother didn't allow him to come home for Christmas, so he was angry and lonely. While driving by the home of a man named Ambrose Griffin, a 51-year-old who was helping his wife bring in groceries, Chase acted on one compulsion that he had been wrestling for years. He pulled out a 22 caliber pistol and shot the father of two in his chest. This act of tragic violence would open a Pandora's box for Chase, one that would seal the fate of other innocent people. Two weeks later, he attempted to enter the home of a woman, but because her doors were locked, he walked away. In a later interview, Chase would say an unlocked door was a kind of invitation to him, a justification for what would happen next. A locked door was a sign that he was not welcome, a strange, eerie rule of thumb for someone with so few rules in his life. On another occasion, Chase was caught in the home of a young couple as he went through their things. He ran out, but not before he defecated and urinated on their infant child's bed and clothing. On January 23, 1978, Chase entered the home of pregnant Teresa Wallen through, of course, her unlocked door. Chase shot Teresa Wallen three times using the same gun he used to shoot Griffin. Then he proceeded to stab her with a butcher knife while having sex with her corpse, cut off a nipple, and then cut out her organs and drink her blood, using an empty yogurt container as a cup. He stuffed dog feces from Wallen's yard down her throat before leaving. Well, it's very hard to read those details out loud, I have to admit. And then Richard Chase decided to stop murdering people entirely committing himself to a life of social service. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. I just had to lighten this up a little bit. Just temporarily take a deep breath because there's more after the break. The it's always the right time deal. Hey, want to go to Mickey D's for lunch? Ooh, let's go now. <laughs> but it's not lunchtime yet. If we're going to McDonald's, it's always the right time. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. There's a deal for every lunch hour at McDonald's. And there's a classic for every craving. Mix and match two for just three fifty, like a McChicken, a McDouble, or a hot and spicy McChicken. Price and participation may vary. Single item at regular price cannot be combined with any other offer. Did you know that for every magazine story that runs, countless others are killed before anyone gets the chance to read them? I'm Justine Harmon, and I'm bringing those dead stories back to life in my new audio check series, Killed. Killed reveals the true stories behind reporting that was once considered too dangerous, too unorthodox, too something by the media. Killed is unlike any show you've ever heard because, well, you've never had a chance to hear these stories until now. Binge the first season now and follow Killed wherever you listen to podcasts to get the full story. Hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. How are you doing? Hello. It's a spooky month. Yeah, it's just, we're still in spooky month, people. Look alive. Yeah. Or dead. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, that's why I feel like we kind of look like year round, right? Perfect. I wonder if anyone would look at us and go, you live in Los Angeles? You live in Southern California? They would never say that. In fact, I uh, am actively made fun of for being very pale. You just got back from Cancun, Mexico. Cancun, Mexico. Where I got a bad sunburn and blisters. You came back a little paler. How? How did that happen? Okay, before we continue, I want to apologize. We had an episode, and I, as a very, very, very pale white woman, perhaps mispronounced something in it. It was about the Chaniques, and I said Chanique. And it might be a regional thing, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. I do a lot of research on how to pronounce things, but sometimes I get it wrong. Hopefully that didn't erode your appreciation of the episode and the spooky creatures. But I, I want to say it, and I want to apologize. I want to say hello to everyone who's listening, spreading the good word, sharing the pod. Mm. You know, you have those pod sharing sessions. <laughs> oh, hip pod sharing salon. Oh, pod share. Yeah. I love like, it. Oh, it's always oh. happening. Well, thank you for doing it during mm -hmm. those sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your black berets just yeah. rapping yeah. about. What's the latest pod? Yeah. Who's what got the pod bod? like? <laughs> We all got the pod bod. Who's got the pod bod? Oof, oof. Another sesh I'd like to talk about is that old government sesh. Mm. Our ghost town government. Mm -hmm. They got their candy ready for yeah. for, for the trick-or-treaters. They're going to divvy it out. They're going to keep the goodies for themselves, though, because they deserve it. The mayor's ready with his toothbrush and toothpastes, ready Aww. to hand out to the kids um, that want something good for them and i oh. appreciate it <laughs> okay you'll take two steven bates hello do you need a ziploc bag full of pennies 
<laughs> Jesus. Oh, I, I'm I'm sorry. In this economy, mm. you're turning that down. You could take that <laughs> and make a nice investment and buy an NFT, courtesy of Ashley Matson. <laughs> Hello, thank you. With thumb drives of her new novel. Oh, I'm wow. sorry. I like reading. I think it helps. <laughs> wow. That would be Dara Rosenzweig. Well, thank you, Dara. That's a trick or literary treat for me. And <laughs> with full candy bars. Oh, shit. Cat Joselle. Full on candy bars. Woo! King size. Oh, damn. And you oh. just got to walk up to that castle on the hill. It's steep, damn. but just, you've come this far. Yeah, she doesn't even answer the door. It's just in a basket outside because she trusts you. But on your way up there, you could read some of that novel. Oh, you could brush your teeth first. Brush your teeth, yeah. You could use some of that money to buy goods. <laughs> great, 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 great. That's Cult cool. survival. That's cool. Our governor, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. So if you want no ads, no chit chat bonus episodes, you just mm -hmm. want the good stuff and to binge, mm -hmm. you can binge through all the old episodes. You can. Go through like 70 bonus episodes with no ads, none oh. of this talk. You don't need it. Patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Did get a message mm -hmm. from our governor. Ooh. Who she spoke. She spoketh and we listeneth. Oh, always. It always. It came down and it's been decreed. Mm -hmm. She said, hey, you know, because anyone who's in the government has the power every single week mm -hmm. for us to get their message out. Hell That's yeah. Always been there. I've mentioned it mm -hmm. before. And some people, you know, the thing is, people are so chill and humble. They're not like somebody like me who would be like, this week, yeah. talk about my stand. Here's my writer. <laughs> Get these names right. Yeah. But it was like, hey, you know, maybe, you know, bring up, not that people need to be brought up, but it, for us to bring up Hurricane Ian mm -hmm. in Florida and, 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 you know, the devastation and tough times. And I feel like everybody, and like, maybe it's because I'm from the East Coast. So many people in Florida. Mm -hmm. I've had family that lives there, live there. I almost lived there once upon a time. Whoa, I never heard that story. Fort Lauderdale, yeah. When I was done, I was like kind of a little New Yorked out before I moved to California. Mm. But love Florida. It's, yeah. a, it's a great state. I know it's fun to poke fun at it. But also, I don't know, I've had really good times there. And there's, I know there's really good people that I know. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess my family's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So. If you haven't yet, and you know, we don't bring up a lot of donations thing on here because we donate separately. Yes. We, you know, are rolling thing every month, you know, different things, same things every month, rolling things. Totally. And we don't want to insert something that's kind of telling you what to do or in case somebody's like, oh, I don't like that charity as much as the another one. And totally. And I just want to respect everyone's, I yeah, guess, their, it's, their it, process. Everyone's, and their, a everyone's got a different process. Absolutely. But. If you haven't yet, or if you wanted to spread the word, Red Cross, mm -hmm. Volunteer Florida. Absolutely. Uh, I found this one called FISH. It's disaster relief, food programs, island-based education, social and senior services, helping hands, financial assistance. That looks really awesome. Um, there's so many good ones out there, and we're going to donate to- In um, the name of Avian Noble. In the name of Avian Noble. Yeah. This is what, what a beautiful break. So we want to say thank you to everyone. And yeah, you know, I'll just- Check in with us. How's everyone doing wherever you are? We love to hear. Absolutely. Especially high Halloween season. Emotions are running high. Costume planning. Figuring it out. We're rolling into the holidays. This is an exciting time for us, for you as well. We want to hear from you. But let's get back to the episode. And I don't really know how to transition this from us being like, yay, great listenership to a serial killer. So let's we're just going to dive in. So we're back. To Richard Chase, the vampire of Sacramento's disgusting, horrifying murder spree. So after the brutal murder of Waylon, a formal investigation began into the linked nature of the murders. In addition to the smaller incidents that were discovered around Sacramento, like burglary of a house nearby or the disemboweled remains of a dog, all of these things were kind of getting lumped together into these string of connected incidents. On January 27th, 1978, a neighbor entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Myroth to find a nauseating, heartbreaking crime scene. Myroth's friend, Daniel Meredith, was murdered in the hallway, dead by a gunshot wound to the head. His car keys and car were gone. Evelyn Myroth and her son, Jason, were found in Evelyn's bedroom. The little boy had been shot twice in the head. Evelyn was partially cannibalized. Her stomach was cut open and she had multiple organs missing. 
There was also a failed attempt to remove one of her eyes, and her corpse had been sodomized. Evelyn's 22-month-old nephew, Michael Fiera, who was staying with them, was missing from their home. The playpen where Michael would normally be was covered in blood and contained a pillow with a bullet hole, so it was assumed that he was also killed, and the suspect took the body with him when he left. Due to the severity of the case, FBI was brought in, and famed FBI agents Robert Ressler and Russ Vorpegel began to develop a profile of the offender. Here's the description. White male, age 25 to 27, thin, undernourished appearance, single, living alone in a location within one mile of abandoned station wagon owned by one of the victims. Residents will be extremely slovenly and unkempt, and evidence of the crimes will be found at the residence. Suspect will have a history of mental illness and use of drugs. Suspect will be an unemployed loner who does not associate with either males or females, and will probably spend a great deal of time in his own residence. If he resides with anyone, it will be with his parents. However, this is unlikely. Suspect will have no prior military history, will be a high school or college dropout, probably suffers from one or more forms of paranoid psychosis. The description sounds, to me, incredibly accurate. Lots of people were questioned in the Sacramento area, but only one person gave a description of the killer that really adhered to what authorities were looking for. And if you believe it, it was an old high school friend of Chase's named Nancy Holder. Holder was doing some shopping at the Town and Country Village Shopping Center in downtown Sacramento. She was in a store, just shopping, when Richard Chase approached her. He blurts out, Were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? Holder and Chase had gone to school together 10 years earlier. Holder, back then, had dated a boy named Kurt, who'd been killed while riding on his motorbike. The 28-year-old didn't immediately recognize Chase, and even if they were strangers, Chase looked gaunt and jarring. She was terse, very uncomfortable, and immediately left them all after their interaction. Holder, when she was leaving, realized that Chase had been wearing the same orange parka jacket mentioned in the description of the uncaptured killer and contacted the police. Investigators ran a background check on Chase and found a 22 caliber gun registered in his name. With the help of an acquaintance from high school, they had finally identified the vampire of Sacramento. Then the FBI started to really put things together, realizing that Chase lived within a mile for most of the murder sites, and of course, the blood at Myroth's house, which there was plenty, matched his DNA profile. There was also a full footprint of his shoe in blood at the crime scene. After obtaining an arrest warrant for Chase and a search warrant for his apartment, police took Chase into custody and found ample evidence in his apartment that linked him to the murders of Griffin, Waylon, Myroth, Meredith, and Myroth's son, Jason. Chase's apartment was, upon the FBI arrival, covered in blood. Authorities also found a 12-inch butcher knife, rubber boots, animal collars, three blenders containing blood, and several dishes inside the refrigerator containing body parts and brains. The walls, floor, ceiling, refrigerator, and all of Chase's eating and drinking utensils were again soaked in blood. A calendar was even found in his apartment containing the word today, marked on the dates of the Wallen and Myroth murders. And they did eventually find the body of Michael Ferreira. Tragically, a mummified, decapitated child's corpse was then found four months later in a box behind a church. It was determined to be the nephew of Evelyn Myroth. In 1979, Chase stood trial on six counts of murder. In order to avoid the death penalty, the defense tried to have him found guilty of second-degree murder, which would result in a life sentence. Their case hinged on Chase's history of acute mental illness and the suggestion that his crimes were not premeditated. But on May 8, 1979, the jury found Chase guilty of six counts of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to die in the gas chamber. His fellow inmates, aware of the extremely violent and grisly nature of Chase's crimes, feared him and, according to prison officials, tried to persuade Chase to commit suicide. While in prison, Chase granted a series of interviews with the very famous FBI profiler I mentioned earlier, Robert K. Ressler. If you love true crime, you know the name. Ressler played significant roles in the psychological profiling of violent offenders in the 1970s. He is most famously credited with coining the term serial killer. He interviewed every serial killer you've ever heard of, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ted Bundy, to name a few. Eventually, I'll have to do an episode just on him because his work is truly intense and fascinating and very important. In any case, Chase spoke to Ressler about lots of things, including his fear of Nazis and UFOs. 
He claimed that although he had killed, it was not his fault. He had been forced to keep himself alive, which he believed any person would do. He asked Ressler to give him access to a radar gun, with which he could apprehend the Nazi UFOs, so that the Nazis could stand trial for the murders. He also handed Ressler a large amount of macaroni and cheese, which he'd been hoarding in his pants pockets, believing that the prison officials were Nazis and were trying to kill him with poisoned food. On December 26, 1980, Chase was found dead in his prison cell. An autopsy revealed that he had died by suicide with an overdose of prescribed medications. And that is the very dark story of Richard Chase, the Vampire of Sacramento, who, for all of his horrific acts, did at the very least help investigators be better able to identify and catch serial killers, something that would change the lives of many in the decades to come and to this very day. It's interesting talking about doors being locked and unlocked, because if we look in Southern California, Richard Ramirez, he would go into homes that were unlocked. And it's just interesting to look back. I was around in the 70s. I was very, 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 very young. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I don't know what the situation with doors were, but I've always locked doors. Maybe mm-hmm. it's my always been my own neurosis mm-hmm. that there's a lock there. You gotta gotta lock these doors. Remember when there was a time where nobody locked their doors? Totally. Like it was better back yeah, then. It was idyllic, you know, and safe. And I think in a lot of cities, there's this kind of delineation. We talk about the Manson murders was this breaking point, or Ramirez, a tipping point of when you think of a city as safe. And not safe, which is not true. Obviously, crimes happen all the time, and you can't really put a, a time stamp on that. But yeah, it's very interesting to see the parallels, Sacramento, New York, Los Angeles, these interesting through lines. And speaking of Robert Ressler, if you watched Mindhunter, mm-hmm. he played Bill Tench. Mm. So Bill Tench was played by Holt McCleary. Holt McClary, I forget the actor's name, he's a great actor. Jonathan Groff, he played his partner, mm-hmm. uh, who I thought was really, really great. And I was really always hoping that season three would, would come out. But both those two FBI agents are the ones that kind of, when it came to profiling yeah. serial killers and kind of making a definition to the term serial killer, which at one point didn't exist. Totally. Now it does. It's just like part of the- It's, it's ubiquitous. Just, it, yeah. It's you. Ub- ubiquitous Um, for sure. And and it's, it's crazy to me to think that that term didn't exist before the seventies and eighties. We've gone through so much of history with so much brutality and to not put that on it and to not have people specifically studying these types of patterns of behavior is wild. His work is so fascinating. I think it's really great that him remembering somebody from school and seeing her Mm -hmm. and approaching her, which is under normal circumstances, you don't want to see people from high school. No, never. You Honestly, don't want to approach them ugh. and see them. Under the best of circumstances. And in this case, it was the best thing that could have happened and the the best outcome. And, you know, this the person, you know, kind of turned him in is a hero. Oh, absolutely. And, and also, like, the imminent danger that she was in. Think about someone from your high school that you barely remember coming up to you about your boyfriend who died, asking you – about if you had been at the place that he died and this man looks disheveled, he is scary looking, and then you leaving as fast as you can, but thinking about putting together a description that you had read at some point earlier and then going to the police about it. And it's, news was obviously prevalent, but mm-hmm. it's not like the way it is now. Like You'd have to maybe catch that once or twice yeah. to, to retain that information. Unlike now, it could be trending somewhere or a lot of people are talking about it because news travels faster but then if you didn't see the 10 o'clock news if you didn't read the sacramento times or or whatever you might not have had that information and it was just i don't know if i necessarily believe in fate or not but Mm -hmm. if it does exist this would be a really great example of it absolutely a string of crimes are solved because you decided to take back a blouse at your hometown mall that is pretty wild (laughs) 
Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino this year. I was only playing for fun, so winning this was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's number one social casino experience. It's serious fun. With over 80 casino-style games to choose from, you too could win life-changing amounts of cash. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumbaCasino.com and give them a whirl. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice in the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of a winner. What does 25 cents back on every purchase mean to you? A free lunch? That gadget you've been eyeing. A night out with the fellas. With your Premise Perks checking account, you get 25 cents back with every purchase using your debit card and zero ATM, overdraft, or annual fees. With this completely free account, you can watch the money roll in with every swipe and find the freedom to go further with your cash. Premise, the bank that gets it right. Premise is a member FDIC. ATM transactions do not count towards debit card rewards. What does 25 cents back on every purchase mean to you? A free lunch? That gadget you've been eyeing. A night out with the fellas. With your Premise Perks checking account, you get 25 cents back with every purchase using your debit card and zero ATM, overdraft, or annual fees. With this completely free account, you can watch the money roll in with every swipe and find the freedom to go further with your cash. Premise, the bank that gets it right. Premise is a member FDIC. ATM transactions do not count towards debit card rewards.